shape and hide. But an unfortunate incident occurred just when I put this book out in New Zealand. The word got, got appropriated by the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, to describe Russian oligarchs, billionaires, who came to New Zealand to tax evade. And that didn't do, do us very, do me a lot of favors. And then uh, the most popular novelist in New Zealand now, whose name is Eleanor Catton, who wrote a book called The Luminaries, and now uh, it just came out as well with another book called Burnham Wood. And in that, her major, um, her major bad guy is an American billionaire who gets into an apocalyptic war with local New Zealanders. So uh, I'm looking at what, what's happening to the word bolt hole, and I'm not liking it too much. Uh, and, and so there were a lot of Americans who bought land down there as bolt holes, and the media was full of it. This, this property, for example, belongs to, uh, it's on Lake Wanaka, belongs to Peter Thiel. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 870 hectares. And um, he, he was the guy that um, started PayPal, and he, and he campaigned for Trump, and now he's down there. Uh, but he doesn't have a bolt hole. He has a land bank. So I have a bolt hole. Okay, and, and now, of course, Jacinda has banned foreigners, and especially billionaires, from buying land banks down there. So I had to present my talk in the context of all of this stuff. My bolt hole is a stream in the Coromandel, that's all. Except in the book, I also describe it as the metaphysical mortal dividing line between running from contamination and searching for redemption. Or Maybe it was the other way around. There are other places in the bolt hole. We have this, this great giant mountain called Blackjack Hill that we have to get over. There's beaches and hotels and bars and marais and gum diggings, gold towns and mines, stamper batteries, and all kinds of roads. So I had to come up with some characters, and to do that, I needed to appreciate the fact that there are essentially three historical periods in New Zealand history if you want to just lump it into three. There was the age of the Maori, the age of stone. There was the mining era, the age of gold. And there was the modern era, the age of chrome. So I came up with some characters for each of these eras. And then I had a problem, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. So in the Maori era, my protagonist, my hero, is a little Maori boy named Tama. And he's uh, the son of the chief of the Rangatira of the um, uh, Natihei tribe in Opito Bay at the far end of the Kuatuna Peninsula, which is on the Coromandel Peninsula, which is on the North Island, which is in him. Okay. So, strange dynamic of the Maoris in that part of the Coromandel. Um, there, were really only, there was really only one thing that happened historically with the Maoris, and that is the Napui who were the big northerners, who were tattooed all over, who were fierce and more rugged than anything that existed elsewhere in, in New Zealand, came running down the peninsula every few years because they were hungry. And the Nati Hay was the larder, basically, for um, the uh, Nipui. So Tama is sitting, is, is, is sort of sitting there one day, and on the ridge line is a ridge of purple above that. And that's the Nipui who come to visit him. The chief of the, of the Nupui was a, was a man named Arawa, and he had a son named Hukiki. In the mining era, I needed a character. I needed a gold miner. So I used my beautiful wife's uncle's name, Billy Green. <laughs> and he needed a sidekick, and his name was One-Eyed Jack. And then in the modern era, I needed a character and so I have one. He's called Dr. Sababa. And he's a Canadian physician. Go figure. And his nemesis is an Auckland property developer named Francis Nestor Dunnikin, who flies his Robinson 22 helicopter pitch black with sort of silver ferns on the side through Sababa's Valley playing Wagner at full volume. So they're going to get along. So if you imagine who these people were, Tama of the Nati Hay, Billy Green, the gold miner, and Dr. Sababa, there's some problems with having three subplots 
in a story that never meets, you would think. You see, I grew the beard because Dr. Sababa had a beard. <laughs> For you uh, cognoscenti in the audience, do you know who that picture is of Dr. Sababa? Bethune. Okay, Charles, you get to play the bonus round. Okay. <laughs> so, the bonus round is this. There are a lot of doctors that were revolutionaries. I'm going to name you five. Bethune, Sun Yat-sen, uh, Jean-Paul Marat, uh, Joseph Warren, and Che Guevara. And my question to you, or anybody else, is what did these five doctors have in common? Sun Yat Sen in Honolulu, and Jean Paul Marat in Edinburgh, and Che Guevara in, in uh, Argentina, all had Scottish professors. Okay, so before I, I try and link up these three characters for you, I need to give you a feel, a sense of what their lives were in the centuries they lived in. Because these guys are just three names on a page, right? So that's what I've done. I've got a little, little short five minute slideshow that's going to take you through what Tama thought of the bolt hole of that stream, because that's, that's the thing that links them is the stream. What Tama thought of it, what Billy Green's bolt hole was, and what Dr. Sababa's bolt hole was. So sit back, relax, enjoy.
characters. That's a poop echo in the background. So, the dilemma I had was, first of all, the characters are, are complicated and they're multi-layered and they're, they're totally rich in contradiction and melancholy, so they have that in common. But how could I have possibly taken those three men in those three centuries 